And good afternoon. You're listening to the new WCEG network on WCEGtalkradio.com, live stream tab, or watch us live on your smart TV, YouTube, WCEG network. I'm Dr. Charles Ross, the host of your personal finance for the next hour. We're the Worldwide Community Empowerment Group, where we speak life into the community. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and on Instagram at WCEG underscore talk underscore radio and at WCEG network. And last but not least, the disclaimer, the topics and questions of those of the show hosts and guests are not the WCEG network. And thank you for uh, continued support. Uh, my guest today is Miss Tyson, Quatoria Tyson. She's a real estate agent and I'm allow her to introduce herself and uh, she's got some uh, slides she's going to share. So I'll just hand it over to you, Ms. Tyson. Well, thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Quatoya Tyson. And like Dr. Ross said, I am a real realtor here in the Atlanta metro area. Um, my affiliated brokerage is I Buy, I Sell Realty. And today I'm going to talk to you about working with a realtor. Like what should you look for um, and things that you should you're looking for a realtor and how that process goes. So I'm going to share my screen and start my slideshow. Um, if you see here, can you everybody see my screen? Can you see my screen, Dr. Ross? Yes, I see it. Okay, great. All right. So working with the realtor. Um, again, Latoya Tyson. I'm a realtor with I Buy, I Sell Realty. And um, we're going to talk about working with the realtor. All right, so there's some key things that you need to know about working with the realtor, and I'm just going to walk you through a couple of those steps just to get you started in um, looking for our, the home buying process. All right, so we're going to start with looking for a home. The first thing you want to do is you want to get a pre-approval letter from a lender. A lender would be anyone like a bank, so Bank of America, Chase, um, you can also, there are also some mortgage lenders like New American, uh, Ameris Bank. Um, there's uh, another big one, Southeast Mortgage is a big one here in the um, Atlanta area. Um, so you need to find a lender that can pre-approve you for the amount of um, home that you should be looking for based on your credit score, um, the based on how much money you make and um, just kind of your debt to income ratio. And what your debt to income ratio means is basically how much debt you have on a monthly basis based uh, compared to how much money you uh, make. So uh, for lenders, most people want to keep your debt to income ratio under about 25 to 30%. So they don't want 25 to 30, over 25 or 30% of your income to go to bills if you want to buy a home. So that's what debt to income means. So, when you go get a pre-approval, how that process works is you turn in your paycheck stubs or any other income that you may have. So child support, um, if you are a veteran and you have, um, you know, veteran funds coming in, disability, or if you're retired and you're a retiree and you have some retire income, a retirement income coming in, they take all of that income into play for your approval. So they will tell you, once they look at all that information, they look at your debt to income ratio, and they say, okay, so now you're um, able to afford a home that's worth this amount. So- hey, Ms. Ms. Tyson, can I stop you just for a second? Yes. You, you mentioned pre-approval. What's the difference between a pre-approval and pre-qualified? Okay, so that's a good question. So pre-qualified means that they're not pulling your credit. They just kind of look over what you have um, in terms of your, um, you know, how much money you make. So that's the debt to income ratio part. But when you get pre-approved is when the lender pulls your credit and then they see what you have on your credit report and that will, in your credit score, that's more of a more solid um, approval. So most people want to work with someone that's been pre-approved, not pre-qualified. Mm, okay. okay. All right. So finding a real. So once you, you got that letter, you got that paper, you got that pre-approval letter, they'll send you, the lender will send you a letter. It'll say, um, John, Jane Doe has been approved for um, this amount of money. Now you need to find a realtor that can help you look for a home. So I made some tabs about what to look for in finding a realtor. 
So there's three different, two different ways you can find a realtor. Um, two, I won't say there's two different ways, but these are the two most common ways. So the first one is referral. So this is the most common way to find a realtor. Check with your friends, your family, your coworkers, ask them, um, you know, do they have a, a, a trusted realtor that they've worked with in the past? So um, it's always good to get a referral from someone because then you can get some insight as to how that person works, you know, what their personality was like. And you, most of the times if you are, you know, you get a referral from one of your friends or your family or coworkers, you kind of have a bit bigger, a, a better trust um, with that realtor. You feel more comfortable going in because you know that someone that you know or you love has worked with that person. Um, if you don't have anyone that has a referral for you, the other way is to go on to realtor.com. Realtor.com will allow you to search for realtors in your area. You can put in a zip code um, and you, it'll pull up any realtor that is uh, registered to work in that area. And they have like little small bios that you can look at and you can um, decide and call people and, you know, just kind of get a feel of who you might want to work with. Um, the thing that you want to do is interview. Yeah. You want to interview. Oh, Dr. Ross. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you want to interview the person that you want to choose as a realtor. So um, we're going to get into what you need to say or what you need to ask when you're interviewing a realtor. So one of the things you want to ask a realtor is, um, you know, how long they've been in the game? Um, you know, how knowledgeable are they about the uh, home buying or home selling process? So, of course, you're not just looking for some, we're not just talking about buyers, we're talking about sellers as well. So if you're selling a home, um, you want to interview a realtor and you want to find out how knowledgeable they are. Like what, what industry knowledge do they have? Are they up on the trends of what's happening? So I don't know if you guys know, but right now it's a seller's market. So that means that the inventory of homes um, is low, but the number of people looking for a home is high. So right now sellers can demand all kinds of things. So you want to find someone that's knowledgeable that knows that this is happening in the, um, especially in the area that you're in, um, to find out if it's a seller or sellers or buyer's market. Um, next thing you want to know is um, experience in your target market. So, what experience does that person have um, in that particular area that you want to live in? So, do they know if there's parks there? Do they know if um, the the you know, just the amenities that are available around the area that you want to live so that they can better um, guide you to, um, you know, to the home that you're looking for. So you want someone that is experienced, has experience in your target market. Also want someone that has a personality that is conducive to working. With. So um, you, you want to make sure the personality is a match. So sometimes people don't like a super bubbly, you know, ex, you know, all over the place person. Um, they may want something, someone that's more subdued or, you know, just you have to interview them to find out if the personality matches your, your style of communication. And uh, dependability. So you want someone that is available um, when you're look, you want to look for homes. You want someone that um, is responsive, that when you have a home that you want to look at, or you're selling your home that you can get in touch with them um, and you can depend on them to uh, answer your questions. All right. And so after you've chosen a realtor, there are a few things that happen. Um, one thing you're gonna buy is you're gonna have a buyer broker agreement or seller's broker agreement. And that agreement is a piece of paper that the realtor will ask you to sign um, and it basically says that um, I'm working with you exclusively. You, you're you're uh, agreeing to work with me exclusively, working with that realtor exclusively, and you're not going to um, use that realtor to find homes for you. And then when it's time to write the contract, you have uh, another realtor that would. Um, so basically, it just covers. It's a um, it's a it's a contract basically that covers both you and the realtor that you chose. Now, I want you to know that um, buyer, broker, and seller broker agreements are not, um, you can break them. <laughs> so it's not something that you're locked into. You Most of the time, it'll have a stipulation on the bottom of it that says, um, you know, we're, we're, I'm your realtor for 90 days, for the next 90 days. But if you 
wanted to go with another realtor, it'll have a little disclaimer usually at the bottom that says, but you can terminate this agreement at any time. What I would suggest is that you make sure that it has that, um, that verbiage somewhere in that agreement, that you can break that agreement at any time. Um, so that if, if it doesn't work out and, it, and maybe it's a, not a good personality match and, or maybe that realtor is not as dependable as you thought they would be, that you can go and look for another one and you're not buying it to that person. And then the, uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, sell it, selling and bu buying commissions. So if you are selling your home, usually the seller is the, the person that carries the cost for the commission of the realtors. So if you're selling a home, the selling agent will set the percentage that they're going to charge you for listing your home and getting your home on the market and selling your home. And they usually uh, share that commission with whoever's buying the home on the other side. So if you're selling your home, that's where the cost comes in. You usually pay a percentage that is negotiated with your um, selling agent about how much um, they're going to um, charge you for selling the home and listing the home. If you're buying a home, you don't have to pay that commission. That commission comes from whoever is selling the home to you. So the agent that is selling the home um, will pay the commission to your realtor. So you don't have to worry about that cost being passed on to you. So those are just kind of the basic steps to um, finding a realtor and you know, kind of getting your feet wet into what you need to do to uh, work with the realtor. And I just have, uh, you know, we have any, if you have any questions, um, we don't have any now and you think of some later. Um, my information is on the screen. Again, I'm Katoya Tyson. Um, my phone number is on the screen. It's 678-525-8447. Uh, you can email me at Katoya at iBuyIsellHomes.com and follow me on Instagram at uh, Cute Homes by QT. So QT is my initial, so I made a little cute little moniker for my Instagram. So you can follow me again on Cute Homes by QT. Do you have any questions in the chat? Well, I have a question. Okay. Um, so do you need a real estate agent to sell your house? Or do you need, uh, on the other side, do you need a real, estate, real, a real estate agent to buy a house? That is a very good question, Dr. Ross. So you do not need a real estate agent to sell your house. Um, and you don't need a real estate agent to buy your house. However, real, realtors are trained and they have the knowledge of uh, real estate law in Georgia. Um, so it's a little bit riskier to uh, not use a realtor when you're buying or selling, only because of the laws that are, you know, in place in terms of like, you know, if you sell a home, if you sell your home, and you don't um, disclose that the roof is falling in. Um, those are the things that the, your realtor will make sure that cross your T's and dot your I's. And if you don't have a realtor to kind of walk you through the law side of buying a home, you are opening yourself up for lawsuits. So it is in the best interest for um, to use a realtor, or real, um, a real estate agent or realtor. And that's interesting because, you know, one of the things that, you know, um, uh, Marcus, you can, you can log on about 535 we went through, we'll be through with Miss Tyson in about 15 minutes. Okay, you got it? You're on mute, but yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so you, you don't need a real estate agent to buy or sell a house, but obviously all the legalities and the documents and all that kind of stuff that has to come, that, that probably helps. I don't know many, I know some people sell their home, which, mm -hmm. you know, for, uh, for sale by owner. Yeah. And that's a little easier. They have, a, they have a lawyer to do the title and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, What's the difference between a, 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 a real estate agent and a real estate broker? Okay, so a real estate agent or a realtor works under a brokerage. So the brokerage is like the managing house that a realtor works under. So to be a, so you have to have your, as a real estate agent, you have to have your license housed, they call it housed, by a broker, which is kind of just a, uh, a management company that makes sure that you um, are compliant 
that you are abiding by all the rules of real estate law, um, that you are, you know, doing contracts with fidelity, that you are have the right verbiage, those types of things. So they're kind of like a management company for the realtor. And every realtor is under a broker. It's, right. it's Georgia law. So there's no there's no there's no advantage if someone says I'm a real estate broker versus a real estate uh, agent then. Really? No. So okay. So for instance, I have a broker that um, that is the that owns I buy I sell realty. He sells homes as well, but mm -hmm. um, he is just the person that's in charge and kind of um, if if something happens where we messed up or I messed up in a in a, in a transaction, my brokerage would be sued um, as a as a team. Okay, so it's it's kind of like you know kind of like a manager you know, for lack of a better term. Got it, got it. So what, what type of commissions can you expect, um, you know, dealing with a real estate agent? What's the minimum? Is that minimum and is a high? I mean, what is, so what is there's, there is no minimum, there is no maximum. So all okay. commissions, okay. all commissions are negotiated, um, but the trends tend to be, um, you know, a, a certain way. So we can't really talk about like, what's the high, what's the low. It's, it's really negotiated, but if, if you look at homes and look at um, different types of commissions or talk to different people, they're kind of in the same ballpark. I've seen, you know, 7% down to, you know, 4%, something like that. But again, all of it is always negotiable based on the seller and the um, selling agent and brokerage what they, what they decide to do. And, and I have to assume that if... Um... If you're buying a home, that's the, the seller negotiated that with the agent. And then um, is it customary that the agent, uh, your agent, if you're buying a home, they split that with the uh, with the uh, selling agent? Yes, it's customary that they share their commission. Is it 50-50 or is it or is that um, negotiated it's, too? It's typically 50-50, um, but again, that's negotiable as well. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so you, you mentioned that this is a, uh, a seller's market. Explain what you mean by that. So seller's market right now all over the country um, basically means that there is a bunch of homes for sale. I'm sorry, there aren't a bunch of homes for sale, but there are a bunch of people looking for homes. Mm. So when we're talking about supply and demand, mm -hmm. um, the supply is low, but the demand is high which means that if you are selling a home right now, you kind of control the market because you have so many people bidding for your, your one home. So um, I've seen where I've put an offer for a buyer into a home that has 80 other offers. 80? 80, 80. <laughs> in, in, in less than a week. So wow. <laughs> people's homes are being sold in less than a week and they're getting more um, than, they're, than they've listed it for. So um, for instance, if there's a house that was listed for 250, uh, people are willing to pay you know, 275 for that home instead of what the asking price is. So that's what the market is doing right now. Um, it's very, it's, um, it could be a frustrating process for buyers right now, but um, people are still getting into homes. People are still selling their homes. Um, there is some inventory out there. There's lots of new construction. New construction is a great um, alternative for uh, buyers at this time because you're not competing with people in terms of bids. So, you know, you go to that mm -hmm. construction site and, you know, you just get on the list and, and if there's a home available and you qualify for that home, you get it. So you're not really, you know, fighting with other uh, consumers and buyers trying to get this bid on this home. So, yeah, it's, it's really crazy right now. And this, I, I read an article and I um, can't remember some real estate article that said that even in uh, a lot of people in California, so you know how high their real estate is in California, um, that a lot of people from California are selling their homes and they're cashing out and they have these big checks because the homes in California are, are expensive. And then they're moving to Texas, which where the home prices wow. are, are lower, much lower, and they're, they're paying for them cash. So what's happening is, people that are in Texas that have, mm -hmm. are from Texas, they are, you know, selling their homes or looking for a home, but they're getting outbid by cash buyers 
that are paying over a hundred thousand over the asking price in cash. Now, my, how does that work then? And you know, I know you know we'll get into the financing part by me asking this question. But so if you if the house lists for two fifty, and I'm assuming that the real estate listing agent did the research and priced it at you know at a at a at a, at a, at a point where they know the it'll it'll appraise for that. So if you pay two seventy five or two eighty or three hundred for a house that was listed at two fifty, how does that work when the appraisal comes back? You know, at two fifty. I mean, so when the, when the appraisal comes back at two fifty, this is the options that the buyers have. Right. They either can make up the difference if if you have an FHA loan. So FHA, um, there's different loans. So there's FHA loan. There's conventional. There's USDA and there's VA loans. Mm -hmm. So FHA loans will not pay, will not approve more than the house appraised for. Mm. They will only pay for the amount the house appraises for. If you want that house that bad and you want it for two seventy five, dollars you have to come with $25,000 extra cash to make it. Wow. So, but what people are doing is they're paying, they're paying, they're, they're making up that difference. <laughs> so, that's what they're doing. And especially if you're coming from a state like New York or Chicago, I mean, New York or Illinois, like in Chicago area or California, where the real estate is um, expensive anyway, and you cash mm -hmm. out and come down to the Southern states, you have that cash. So, um, you know, if you cash out on a brownstone, that was a million dollars and, you know, worth a million dollars and you bought it in the eighties and you have, you know, three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars worth of equity and you bring that to to the South and you buy a home for 300,000, I can just pay cash for that. And I can outbid everyone. That's amazing. And, you know, I, I see that happening. And my suspicion is that at some point, and don't know when, that all these people, because what I understand is happening, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's a lot of people out there who have homes who want to sell, but they don't want to sell because then uh, they know the inventory is low. They may not be able to find a house to replace it. So they're hanging on to what they have and say, well, okay, I'm not going to do anything right now because yeah. even if I sell my home, I'm not going to be able to find a house, you know, another house to move into. And, Absolutely. And, and, that's and, exactly uh, what's happening. And I, I actually just spoke with a coworker today about selling her home. And that was the first thing she said, well, where are we going to go? <laughs> right. If we sell our home because she's seen all these homes going up in her neighborhood and she's mm -hmm. been in her neighborhood since the, I think, early, the late 70s, early 80s. And she said that the homes in her neighborhood are astronomical, like the prices that they're being selling, sold for. So she's excited, like, well, maybe we should, you know, she's an empty nester. And she's like, you know, we don't have any kids anymore. We don't need this big house. Maybe we should mm -hmm. sell it. But, uh, you know, she said her husband's like, well, where are we going to go instead? So, yeah, it's, it's really a big, it's a big, you know, it's a concern. It's a concern. You definitely don't want to leave in this market. Definitely don't want to buy your house without having somewhere else to go. What do you think is going to happen? What is your estimation is at some point, all this pent up demand is going to come to the market. These folks that want to sell their homes, they're going to you know, come to the market. Uh, is that going to happen this year, next year? Because at some point, you know, the folks are going to put their houses on the market and sell. I mean, it's going to switch around. Uh, any idea when you think that would ha will happen? So our listeners and viewers can say, okay, I'm not going to sell my house this year. Maybe I'll wait to the first, second quarter of next year. Is that a likely scenario? Un unfortunately, <laughs> um, in the in the real estate arena right now, it's mm -hmm. it's so crazy that it's you know it was predicted that it will slow down and it will switch around um, late twenty twenty, and it's just gotten you know higher and higher. You know, real estate prices have gotten higher and higher. So mm -hmm. um, no one really knows. It's kind of an unprecedented time right now. So this is something that hasn't happened. Um, before and so, the, to predict when it will turn around is is almost impossible at this moment. You just have to keep watching the market. Yeah, and I think that's the real challenge that a lot of people face. You know, in terms of doing that, uh, are there are there certain kinds of agents? Like I heard, there are buyer agents, listing agents. You know, there are different kinds of agents that uh, would be better for depending on what type of transaction you're getting into. Uh, um, yeah, so there's just two types of agents. So there's a seller's agent and a buyer's agent. So if you're selling your home, um, and most agents, uh, realtors are, you know, they can do both. So um, for my speaking for myself, if you were selling your home, I can help you sell your home. If you're buying a home, I can help you buy a home. Um, 
usually they're commercial people have a certain um, area arena so either there's you know um, commercial there's commercial commercial real estate so if you're looking for a space for your business um, there are certain realtors that specialize in commercial real estate so um, but then there's people that specialize in you know just home dwelling so um, but yeah just two typically two different types of buying agent um, and your seller's agent. And, uh, and it's my understanding with the listing agents, they just focus on getting properties that, you know, that they are listing. In other words, that uh, they represent that seller and, um, and they're going to get paid whether they sell it or not. You know, I guess, uh, you know, just accumulating, you know, a lot of uh, uh, properties. What has been your, your biggest experience in terms of dealing with, with buyers? What is the biggest pitfall that a lot of buyers, when they come into the market, what are some of the things that you see that you know, is a challenge for you in dealing with buyers? Um, unrealistic expectations, not enough money, they're not pre, pre-approved. Um, what, what are some of the things that you see that if you were talking to a, a, a potential buyer that they need to make sure that they stay abreast of? Um, That's a great question. So um, what I am typically seeing um, during this time is um, a lack of funds. So um, you really need to save um, enough money to cover your earnest money when you're trying to buy a house. And earnest money is just kind of like a good faith deposit. Um, And it's usually 1% of, it's typically about 1% of the purchase price of the home. So um, the other part of the money you need to have are closing costs. So typically in a normal market, um, the seller usually contributes to closing costs for you. So they want to help you close. Um, Closing costs includes all the the taxes and fees from your lender, um, you know, um, insurance, those types of things. And it's uh, a total that you bring to the table on the day that you get your keys, which is called closing. And you go to an attorney, they make sure all the paperwork is correct, and then you have to have a a check. So um, closing costs right now in this seller's market, the buyer needs to prepare to pay for all their closing costs on their own. So sellers are not, um, it's not going to be competitive. Um, You won't have an attractive offer if you ask for money from the seller. Um, So you need to be prepared. And what I'm seeing is a lot of people aren't prepared for that. They they haven't been um, groomed. There, no one has told them that they should prepare to pay for their closing costs um, on their own. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's pretty much the thing. The, the biggest issue is funds. So you really, in this market, you really need to have a good amount of money saved up if you want to compete with the other buyers, especially because a lot of people are paying cash for these homes. So, so if, you, if you're looking into looking at uh, buying a home, how many houses should you look at before you say, OK, that's the right one? Now, considering the market we're in, uh, obviously, you can't look at a whole bunch because uh, when I was looking for a house back in September, um, I mean, I literally was down, the, you know, pulled out of the driveway of a, of a house that we wanted and it was already under contract by the time we get the end of the block. <laughs> so with that being said, you know, what should be a strategy in terms of, uh, you know, number of houses that you should look at before you pull the trigger? I mean, if you look at a house, you say, oh, I like that one, should you say, okay, or should you look at some to get an idea? What, do, what are your thoughts on that, given this environment? So in this environment, um, there really isn't a number. Um, you just need to love the home that you're putting an offer on. So one of the other things that is happening is people are getting anxious. So they're like, I'll just, you know, I'll just put an offer on this and this and this, you know, but you really need to love the home that you're putting an offer on and you can be picky. It's okay to take some time to look for the home. There's no rush um, because at the end of the day, this is your money that you're using to buy the home. So you want to make sure that you love the home that you chose and not choose a home, you know, hastily because of the market how the market is behaving. So um, I would say there's really not a number that you should look at. I had a client that I just started with yesterday and the first home she looked at, she loved it. And so we put an offer on it. So, um, and and she she kind of felt like, should I put an offer on it? Because it's the first one. I said, do you love it? (laughs) If you know, if you love this home, then yeah, let's put an offer on it. If this is what you want, then let's put an offer on it. So it can be the first home. It can be the 
30th home. And you never know. Just make sure that you are making the decision and you're not letting the market make the decision for you. Is there a checklist? Because I know it would have to it would have to be frustrating for me to work with a potential buyer and they really don't know what they want. You know, do they want a nice kitchen? Do they want a pool? Do they want a basement? Do they want a ranch? So do you go through that process and say, okay, what are you looking for? You know, is that a, is that a process that you go through with a potential buyer to make sure that you show them the houses that really going to fit within quote, I love you range? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Yes, I do. And um, at the beginning, when I have a potential um, client, I walk through everything, their wants, their super wants. We ask for super wants. We ask for, um, ask for, you know, what is your deal breakers? What If you saw this, you're like, no, I don't want this home. Um, and it's also um, important for um, realtors to talk to their clients about certain things in terms of if they have a home, if they see a home that they love. And sometimes when you walk into a home, Um, other people's furniture and the way they design or, you know, decorate can kind of throw you off and you can't, you know, you can't really visualize what the home really looks like. And so I kind of try to help my clients, you know, try to not look at what the other person has and look Mm -hmm. at the structure of the home and the structure, you know, the format and the floor plan of the home and see if that works for you. Because ultimately when you get in, of course you have to put your, you're going to put your own touch on it. Um, And also, uh, you know, things that are cosmetic. So someone might like, you know, gold finishes or silver finishes. I, I try to, you know, tell my clients, you know, don't concentrate on those things because those are things that you can change. So paint color of the, of the, you know, somebody has a bright orange, you know, wall, and they're like, "Ooh, I don't want this house because it's a bright orange wall." But you can change. <laughs> you can change the paint on the on the wall. So, you know, I we we do um, extensive work with uh, clients to help them, you know, visualize things and, or look at things in a different way, um, and kind of educate them on the process of the home buying process. I read an uh, article not too long ago where uh, <laughs> this couple, I think it was a couple. Uh, and I'll get to the point, they, uh, you know, got the house appraised and they, uh, you know, had certain artifacts in the house that indicated that there were people of color. Uh, they got it appraised and it came in at one price, let's say it came in at 200000 They took those artifacts out and just made it kind of bland, like you couldn't tell if the person living in here was black or white. And the appraisal went up, I think it was like 40, 50, I can't remember what the amount was. So in, 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 in me sharing that, is that some of the advice you give? Because uh, I've been in houses and I'm like, okay, yeah, a black person lives here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, so do you advise them to make it real neutral yeah. so that folks can't tell, you know, whether it's a black or white person? Is that, you know? Well, and, and, in, in terms of code of ethics, we can't really advise on like, you know, race and things like that. But we do often um, advise um, clients that are selling their home just to make the home neutral so that people can visualize their own things in the home. Mm. So you don't want a lot of clutter. You don't want a lot of pictures up on the wall, those types of things, because you want the buyers that come in to look at the room and be able to see all of the room um, in the area so that they can visualize their own things. So they're not looking at it like how I say, and a buyer comes in and says, ooh, that's just You know, that's too much. I don't like that house. So you want to just neutralize it just for those reasons. So people can visualize themselves in the home. But, um, you know, of course, I've read that same article. Um, That's, you know, inspection is a whole different industry. Um, We do work, of course, work with inspectors. um, But we don't have any influence on that inspection, um, on those inspections. And I mean, I'm sorry, appraisals. I'm sorry, not not inspections, appraisers. Um, We don't have any influence on appraisers. But um, we just hope that the appraisers that um, come in are you know, non-biased and, and give a fair shot to everyone and appraise the home for what they need to be appraised for. So, But we do know that that does exist, unfortunately. Um, but you know, to, to try to curb some of that stuff, yeah, we do kind of you know, try to make you see the things, um, I mean, to make your home kind of neutral. Do you advise clients to get an inspection because... I think some people confuse an appraisal as if that's an inspection. In other words, that the appraisal is going to tell me what's wrong with the house. 
And of course, you know, that's not true. So do you advise clients to spend, because it it, an inspection could cost anywhere from three to $500. Yeah. You yeah. know, do you yeah. advise them to get, get an inspection done? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a period when you put a contract on a home called due diligence um, and you ask for a certain amount of days right now the due di to make your offers um, more attractive and more competitive. You want to shorten the due diligence period. <laughs> so, um, you know, you ask for, you know, three to two to five days um, so that during that period is when you um, pay for an inspector to go in and they look at the house from top to bottom and kind of give you a list of things that are, that are wrong with the home. Um, and then you can ask your um, sellers to fix these things for the contract to continue on. If they refuse to, you can choose to uh, terminate the contract at no penalty to you at the time. So that due diligence period is when you have to find an get an inspection and, and then see where do you go from here. So yes, inspection is to find what's going on in the home. Are there any um, defects, um, are any structural issues? Are there termites? Um, you know, anything that's wrong with the home that may um, cause issues later on and you ask the seller to fix them. After that due diligence period, um, that there's, you're, you're buying it in that contract. So you, even if there, you find something after that, uh, so if you didn't get an inspection during that due diligence period, and then you find something afterwards, you're kind of stuck in that contract. What's a, what's a typical due diligence period? What's a range of, of time? You mentioned two to five days. Is that customary? Uh, Ten days, seven days? Or? So customary, um, you know, you know, before this market, <laughs> you know, we, you know, you might see, you know, four, seven, eight days. Um, if you want to be competitive in this market, I see some people have one day, two day due diligence. Mm. Um, so right now, you know, I typically, you know, try to ask for at least three days to get, you know, an inspection an inspector out there. Um, that, that could be something that you do, um, some, something that you do during your, after your pre-approval is kind of get an inspector on, on deck. Um, ready so that maybe if you can do a one day do the due diligence that will make your offer look more attractive. Um, and if you have an inspector that you can call and you know they can go right out in one day and get that inspection done. Awesome, awesome. Uh, and those are the things that I think that people you know don't realize you know getting into particularly for first time home buyers. If you bought a house before, you generally know what to expect. But first time home buyers, I think you know a lot of times they got to be able to take them you know be able to have somebody walk them through the process and that's a very sensitive time. And uh, now, you know, when I, we looked at houses and when we were talking about how many houses, you know, echoes, I think 10, 15, but you know, a week's time, cause we go out and look at four or five different properties. And after a while, the challenge is that they all start looking together. They all come together. <laughs> unless you take a, unless you take real copious notes, yeah. you're gonna be like, okay, what was that the house owner? And then you just forget, you know, um, right. <laughs> you know, to, 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 you know, what, what that house looked like, what the things you like. That's why I think it's important that, you know, prospective buyers know exactly what they're looking for yes. uh, and what's out there, you know, and search around to be able to do that, you know, from that standpoint. Yes. And I think that really helps, you know, uh, folks to be able to understand, you know, what they're, what they're able to do. So, yes, you know, that's absolutely. a good thing. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ms. Price. Any uh, a parting advice that you want to give folks? Um, I just want to say, don't be shy. Um, get out there, sell your home. We can find you. I, there are people that can find you homes. You can go into a new construction. You can take some equity out of your home and apply that to another home. And if you're a buyer, don't be discouraged. Um, they, your home is out there waiting on you. Um, it might take a little bit of time, but it's okay. Um, you will find your home. And again, I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Ross, for having me on. And again, um, if you want to contact me for more information, my information is on the screen. Um, you can start following me at Cute Homes by QT on uh, Instagram. And um, you can contact me by phone, text, or email. Thank you. Awesome. All right, Ms. Dyson. All right. Nice talking to you. Take care thank now. You. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Buying a home is such a, a challenge, you know, for a lot of folks. And one of the things 
that you might want to think about when you're buying a home is uh, looking at, uh, you know, you have uh, new construction and then you have resales. And oftentimes with resales, you have uh, a little bit more flexibility. With a new construction, you generally have uh, a set price. And the going rate now is I think that new construction costs about $100 a square foot. So if you're buying a 300,000 square foot a house that's going to be 300,000. So, and the builder has costs already built in. And so you don't really have a lot of negotiating room, you know, in, in that regard. Whereas a resale, meaning a house that was on the market and then, um, you know, uh, is now come, it was, you know, it's not a new home. You don't know, you know, what the issue is that why the uh, seller is selling. You don't know if they have a mortgage on it. You don't know how much a mortgage they have. There's some information you can find out on some of the platforms like Zillow and uh, Realtor.com, uh, Trulia, you know, some of these websites that, you know, will give you some idea uh, what they bought the house for. That'll give you some idea, but it won't tell you, you know, what type of mortgage they have on and that from that standpoint. Um, and, and the other thing is looking at, you know, you hear about these deals as far as, you know, guaranteed, you know, um, uh, price or whatever. Uh, in other words, I think uh, one of the companies, Mark Spain, I've seen his advertising, a couple others, you know, where they'll say, uh, uh, we guarantee you, you'll get an offer. I mean, we're going to make an offer on your house, I meaning it's going to be sold at some price. And that's always uh, an attraction. I know for my wife and I, when we just uh, bought our forever home back in September, uh, I'm trying to think of how many houses that we looked at. Uh, well, we looked at houses for about three, maybe four months and put an offer on a house that fell through for, uh, and once again, that was uh, because of the inspection. You know, we went to the inspection and it was a great house, needed some work, but the inspection came back and it was so much that had to be done. Uh, we dodged the bullet on that one. And then we found our forever home. And even the, 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 the issue of getting an inspection uh, allows you to be able to um, use that to negotiate the price because if there are items on that inspection list that you know you want to have to take care of, then obviously you know um, uh, you can either lower the price and say okay it's going to cost uh, let's say um, you know uh, the floor is warped and it's 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 parquet floors or whatever and you're going to have to get it repaired. Then there's an option you know where you can say well um, we're going to take. X amount of dollars off it, or you're going to have to repair it before we buy it, those kinds of things. Most of the time, you know, most sellers have already, you know, figured out. In other words, they've already determined that, you know, guess what? This is what we're going to buy the house for. This is what we're going to sell the house for as is. They're not going to negotiate a lot. And that's going to create a challenge, you know, for, for, um, for a lot of people. They're going to sell the house as is. They're not looking to do any major repairs. And the price should reflect that, but it is a seller's market, and um, and that's the real you know concern right now is that uh, you know it's a seller's market, and you know if you're going to go out there and buy, then you got to be prepared to deal with some of the things that you know you know you have to deal as far as uh you know being you know going to buy property. I know for you know as many of you might know that my wife and I we are real estate investors. Uh, we buy these small houses, as we call them. <laughs> you know, sub 30 houses. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that we do, and let me see if I can pull this whiteboard up here. So, and this is what we do. See if you can get with this. So what we're looking at, and let's see if this works. Okay, so we're looking to buy uh, $30,000 houses, okay? That's, that's kind of our sweet spot, okay? And uh, put my little dollar sign here. <laughs> so, we're looking to buy a $30,000 house. Now, typically, you know, we're getting a finance. Now, typically, that's a problem. You say, well, why is that a problem? That's a problem because most banks won't lend on properties that are below $50,000, uh, and some won't lend for properties under $75,000. But we found a bank that will, okay? And so, uh, you know, when we first started dealing with this particular lender, the down minimum down payment was 15%. That means that we'd have to come out of our pocket with $4,500. But 
with all the things that are going on in the market, the uncertainty, COVID, and so forth and so on, they pull back and say, okay, we're still going to do, uh, you know, sub-50 loans, sub-50,000 loans, but we're going to require a bigger down payment. Now, you have to ask yourself, you see, why would they do that? Why would they require a bigger down payment? And the reason is simple. They want you to have more skin in the game. You know, now going from, from 15 to 20 on a $30,000 property is roughly $1,500, right? So because 20% of 30,000 is 6,000, 15% of 30,000 is 4,500, okay? So, but that's just their way of saying, we want you to have a little bit more skin in the game because the thought is that, if you do that, then you won't be as willing to walk away from the property because they don't want the property. People think the bank wants your property. No, they don't want their property or property. They want your, your principal and interest payment. That's what they want, okay? Preferably their interest, okay, <laughs> interest payment. But so that's why they do that. I'm hoping it goes back the other way. So anyway, so, so this is what we do. So we buy these houses for, and I'm going to show you our little game plan here, okay? So at 20%, okay, so I'll put my little percent sign here, my little bootleg percent sign. <laughs> so that's six grand, right? Okay, so that's six grand that you gotta come out of your pocket. Okay, that property in the market that we're in, we could rent that property out for about $500 a month. Well, let's say six, I mean, we could do six in this market. Okay, uh, that's a six right there. <laughs> okay, and $600 a month. So 600 times 12, let me do my little calculator here. 600 times 12 is $7,200 in rent. Okay, now here's what we do. Okay, when I look at a property, when I'm presented and, and our criteria for our properties are number one, that they be sub 50, okay? Number two, that they be in de decent shape. Number three, that they be tenant occupied, okay? And I'll layer on top of that, that they be section eight. Everybody know what section eight is. Section eight is a program by the Department of Housing and Urban Development where they give vouchers to individuals that allow them to rent properties. So for example, Someone could get a voucher for the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development uh, for $600. That means that the government's gonna pay, okay, that rent at $600. They could get a house where the rent's 700. And all that means is that they would have to, the government will pay the six, they'll have to pay the difference. Now, why do you think I like Section 8? You know, Section 8 has gotten a bad name because you know they uh, attribute it to poor people, which is not necessarily poor people, just people who have low income. Not every poor, you just got low income. And so why would I want Section 8 property? For one reason, I get my money at the first of the month, every month, 12 months out of the year. Let that sink in for a second. Now, you have to be selective in who you rent to because there are some folks that have tear up places. There are people who don't want Section 8 that have tear up places. So you guys got to be careful. And my strategy has always been is to interview the person that, you know, um, at their place of residence, preferably uh, of where they currently are renting. Uh, of course, ask them why they're leaving. Uh, they got to got a decent reason for that. You know, granted that we've, uh, checked out their credit. We checked out the rent roll to see how they paid them their uh, rent. But if a person, if you're sitting in their living room or at their kitchen table, or wherever, and they're tearing up that place, chances are they're going to tear up your place. And you don't want that because that's just a big headaches. Okay. Uh, so that's the key thing is making sure that your tenant uh, is going to take care of, of, of you know, of, of your particular property, you know, so that's important, okay? Um, the other thing is that you get your money at the beginning of the month, it's dependable, and it just solves any problem of chasing people down for your rent money, 
okay? So when I analyze a property, so if I'm looking at a 30,000, a 30,000, uh, 30K property, uh, renting for $600 a month. So the first thing I do is say, okay, um, I want to see what my cap rate is. And that cap rate is basically what you're getting, what return you're getting. So for example, if the house is renting for $600 a month and I multiply it by, you know, we got 72, so you divide 7,200, that's 72,000, 7,200 into 30,000. And that's a cap rate of 24%. So if you were to divide 30,000, okay? I'm gonna put it down here, 30K. I'll put that little divided sign. You know, uh, 7,200, because that's the yearly rent, that equals 24%. Okay? So that's my first now. That's what I'm getting. So if you look at it as if I put money, if I let's, let's look at think about from a bank for example. So if I uh, put $30,000 into a bank and I get 10% on my money, that's $3,000, right? So that's the way I look at the house. That house is my CD, so to speak, my certificate of deposit, my savings account, okay? And I wanna see what type of return I'm getting because I'm purchasing that. So you take the 7,200, that's the money you're getting off of it. And you divide that into the purchase price. And that gives you your, what we call capitalization rate, cap rate. Let that sink in for a second. What I'm looking for are properties. If a property is doing at least a 15%, that's a, that's a winner. It's, it checks off that box and I say, okay, I could, I, I could, I could, I could live with that. But you're probably saying, okay, how about taxes and insurance and things like that? It's a good question. So what I do is I say, okay, so I multiply 600 times 12. In this case, to take, to take an account taxes and insurance, you know, property taxes and homeowners insurance, I'm going to multiply it by 10, okay? So what I'm, what I'm saying is that those two other months, okay, that's those two other months is $1,200, 600 and 600 is $1,200. That's for taxes and insurance. So now I take 6,000, okay, 6,000, and let me see if I can erase this. Yeah, here's the eraser, okay. Oh, 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 very good, there we go. Okay, so let's erase this stuff for a minute and get my little, I think, drawing hand. Oh, hold on for a second, let me keep erasing. So now we're gonna divide 6,000, uh, 6, which is 600. Let me see if my drawing, is that, uh, I think that's my drawing thing. Let's see, is that it? Uh, that's not what I want. Okay, I lost my little uh, thingy. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, anyway, so if I take 6,000 6, 6, and divide that into 30K, 30,000, that equals 20%. That's, that's, that's a good yield. I'm trying to get my drawing thing back. Yeah, uh, let's see, let's see if that works. Oh, no, no, it's draws, but that's not what I want. Uh, this text, no, we don't want that. Uh, no, okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so what you what you do is that now I'm getting twenty percent, six thousand into th uh, into thirty thousand is twenty percent. So that's a great deal, okay. And so that's the first barometer. And so the question that you'll have to ask yourself is like if you're doing this as a um, is a uh, um, as an add-on to your retirement or as a strategy, then you probably want to say, how many houses do I want to buy? Now, for, for my wife and I, we're looking at probably getting uh, around, um, why isn't this thing working? Uh, that's, a, that's a little thing. Anyway, so the question then becomes, how many houses do you want? How many, and I believe that if you're looking, 
you know, to buy, you know, houses, you should buy, if you're going to go into real estate as an investment, and we're buy and hold investors, then you should look at uh, how many houses that you want to want to purchase. You should, you shouldn't do one. When I hear people comment and say, I used to be a real estate agent, but I just couldn't deal with the ten tenants. Okay, I, I get that. But you, that's why we have a property manager. Okay, <laughs> we're not going to be fooling around with that kind of stuff. You know, so those are the things that I look at that, you know, I say, okay, you know, I'm going to make sure that, uh, you know, that that I have a property manager to get all those calls about the toilet stopped up, uh, you know, the, the faucets le leaking or whatever the case may be, and let them deal with that. And so our, our desire is to own 20 properties. So let's do the math on this. So 600 times 20, so 600 times 20 houses, 600 a month, the average, uh, average um, a rent, that's $12,000 a month times 12 months, that's $144,000. Let that sink in for a second. You think you can live on $144,000? Or maybe you're not that generous. Maybe you say you have some retirement money, a pension or whatever. So you say, okay, I'm just going to do 10 houses. So that's 6,000 times 12 times uh, 10. That's $72,000 a year. So you have to go in with a strategy of, of what, you, what, you, what you're in it for. You know, how many, how many properties that you want to buy and do that. Uh, and then you have to study and, and get yourself ready for that, you know, and find ways to do that. That's, uh, I believe that real estate is, you know, people are doing cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, uh, stock investing, you know, fine. But they're not making any more real estate. And if you look at almost every millionaire or billionaire, they have two things in their portfolio. They have um, usually a business and they have real estate. And generally, like I said, they have both. And their business might be real estate. And they may dabble in the stock market, but they're looking for passive income. Because when I buy that property for $30,000, guess what? I don't have to do anything else. Like put a CD in the bank. I don't have to do anything else with that. I'm done. Okay. I don't have to do anything else to be able to, you know, uh, deal with that. And that's what passive, passive income. If, if you've watched this show uh, for a while, we've had folks on talking about mobile home investing, apartment investing, um, trucking, vending. All these things are passive income, meaning once you make the investment, you don't have to work at it anymore or very little. And that's what you want, you know. So those are some things to think about, you know. That's why I had uh, Ms. Tyson on to talk about working with a real estate agent. Um, and because you're going to need a real estate agent to help you navigate this. I think it's very difficult to buy a house without a real estate agent. I mean, you can. But I just think that there's too many risks involved in, in doing it. And so I do recommend that you get a real estate agent to do that, you know, to help you in that process. Well, once again, we thank you so much for being a part of your personal finance uh, with Dr. Charles Ross. And um, we're going to uh, let you know we'll be back here next week. And I'm still working on that show. But as always, there'll be something around finance. You can bet your bottom dollar that. <laughs> so we thank you so much for being a part of what we're doing. And, um, you know, we look forward to you coming back and joining us again because we enjoy helping people understand the financial world that they're living in and making sure that they understand that whatever things they do, they have the right knowledge to do it. Thank you so much for listening and watching Your Personal Finance with Dr. Charles Ross.